I'm your host, Anna Danino, and welcome to episode 12 of the Crime Bistro Podcast. This show gazes into the thrillingly twisted world of true crime, examining real cases, while we share in a passion for crime and coffee alike. For this episode, I am enjoying a hot hazelnut coffee, so grab yourself a fresh brew and let's get into the conspiracy of the death of Marilyn Monroe. Marilyn Monroe is one of the most famous names in American film history. She was an actress who starred in a number of commercially successful films in the 1950s, and she is also considered a pop culture icon. Marilyn is a figure who started from nothing before she rose to fame, and her death was a tragedy in many ways. However, she had the great capacity to be a role model for girls and women everywhere, and at only 36 when she passed away, I believe Marilyn had much more to give to the world than what she had time to offer. Marilyn Monroe was born Norma Jean Mortensen, later called Norma Jean Baker, on June 1st of 1926 in Los Angeles, California. Baker was her mother's last name, and she adopted her mother's name at her baptism. As an interesting side note, there is actually a band named Norma Jean after her. Her early life and childhood were very troubled and definitely somewhat traumatic, and it made her a relatively reserved person, although she also came out of it quite independent as a result. Her mother was frequently spending time in a mental institution for her psychiatric troubles, so Marilyn spent a good amount of time in foster homes growing up and was cared for by a total of 12 different sets of parents, even spending some time in an orphanage. Marilyn maintained as an adult that her mother was unfit to care for her and that one of her earliest memories was of her mother trying to smother her in her crib with a pillow. And even into adulthood, Marilyn never knew or met her father. In 1937, a family friend and her husband, Grace and Doc Goodard, took care of Marilyn for a few years, receiving a $25 weekly stipend from Marilyn's mother. This couple was deeply religious and followed fundamentalist doctrines, meaning Marilyn was prohibited from many things. Interestingly enough, this included watching movies. She wasn't with the Goodards for too long. After Doc's job was transferred to the East Coast, they could not afford to bring her with them, and she returned to the foster system. Marilyn dropped out of high school by the time she was 15 years old, and on June 19th of 1942, at the age of 16, she married her neighbor, Jimmy Doherty, who was 21 years old, and the primary reason for this union was so Marilyn wouldn't be sent away to another foster home. They had actually only been dating for a few months at the time. Due to her unstable childhood, it is likely that Marilyn was extremely excited at the prospect of having a family, and more than that, a place to belong. Jimmy joined the military about a year after they got married, and while he was away fighting in the South Pacific, she began working at a munitions factory, where she was first discovered by a photographer, and the two divorced in September of 1946, which was the year that Jimmy returned. This factory was located in Burbank, California, and it was extremely common work for women at the time, considering the number of young men who were fighting overseas, The factories were understaffed, and a common job for women to hold was in the production of wartime supplies. And as mentioned, it was at this factory that Marilyn got her big break. A photographer named David Conover was covering the munitions factory to take photos of women contributing to the war effort, and he was struck by Marilyn's beauty, using her in a great number of his pictures. One of the first publications she was featured in was a magazine called Yank, the Army Weekly. She quickly gained popularity as a model, and in 1946, she signed a short-term contract with 20th Century Fox, which is when she created the screen name Marilyn Monroe and dyed her hair blonde. She came up with the name Marilyn Monroe herself, using the names of a couple of family members, and she made a few brief appearances in movies from the Fox and Columbia Studios, but she became unemployed again and returned to modeling. In 1948, a nude photograph of her on a calendar propelled her into a role in the film Scudda Hay, and this was followed by some other minor roles. It was expected that posing for nude photographs would be seen as too risque, however, she only gained traction in her career from it. In 1950, she played a small, uncredited role in the asphalt jungle that reaped a large amount of fan mail, and her second appearance in a 1950 film, All About Eve, gained her another contract from Fox as well as a heavy amount of recognition and fame. This was followed by a succession of films, including Let's Make It Legal in 1951, Love Nest in 1951, Clash by Night in 1952, and Niagara in 1953. Her fame only grew as she appeared in Gentlemen Prefer Blondes in 1953, How to Marry a Millionaire in 1953, and There's No Business Like Show Business in 1954. 
As an actress, she was known for her breathy voice and hourglass figure, and she became an iconic figure in Hollywood glamour and fashion. As a model, she was also very successful around this time, and she was actually featured in the first issue of Playboy. In 1954, she married baseball star Joe DiMaggio, and the publicity surrounding this was enormous. This was a relatively short-lived marriage, and they divorced less than a year later, at which time Marilyn started to become discontented with her career. The two did remain good friends after they divorced, and it did seem like a bit of an odd match considering that DiMaggio didn't love the spotlight. However, Marilyn did have a lot of difficulty with being famous, and she never sought out her fame, so it is likely that the two connected over that aspect of their lives. Marilyn struggled with pre-performance anxiety that sometimes made her physically ill and caused her to constantly be late to film sets, which was something that irritated co-stars and crew members. Her troubled childhood and the pressures of her fame started to haunt her, and she has been famously quoted saying, quote, being a sex symbol is a heavy load to carry, especially when one is tired, hurt, and bewildered, end quote, as well as, quote, if I close my eyes and think of Hollywood, all I see is one big varicose vein, end quote. She struggled a lot with being famous, likely because she didn't have a great support system behind her. Marilyn moved to New York City to study with Lee Strasberg at the Actors Studio, and she became well-known as a comedian as she starred in The Seven Year Itch in 1955 and in The Bus Stop in 1956. She really wanted to be taken seriously as an actress, and though she was famous for her beauty, she wanted something other than the blonde bombshell role. She was often cast as the dumb blonde, but though she had a limited education, those around her said she was really very smart which gives the sense that as Marilyn Monroe, she really felt like she was only playing a part. June 29th of 1956 saw her longest marriage to playwright Arthur Miller. The couple first met at a party in 1950 and began to exchange letters. They met again when Marilyn moved to New York in 1955 and began an affair while she was still married to Joe DiMaggio. Their marriage had problems right away and Marilyn experienced two miscarriages and an ectopic pregnancy during it. This also seemed like an odd match, since Miller was widely regarded as an intellectual, while Marilyn was portrayed in the media as a dumb blonde. Marilyn briefly retired from acting, although she did star alongside Lawrence Oliver in The Prince and the Showgirl in 1957. She won critical acclaim for the first time as a serious actress for her role in Some Like It Hot in 1959, which she won a Golden Globe for, and her last film was the drama titled The Misfits in 1961 which was written specifically for her by Arthur Miller. Despite this, their marriage disintegrated during the production, and the couple divorced on January 20th of 1961. The Misfits was released about a month after this, and it flopped at the box offices. Marilyn's use of drugs and alcohol to cope with the hardships of fame contributed to her marriage ending, as well as her blaming herself and her substance use for her miscarriages. Marilyn spent the first months of 1961 coping with various health concerns. She underwent surgery for her endometriosis, spending four weeks in a hospital with a brief stay in the mental ward for her depression. And throughout this, Joe DiMaggio was very much there for her, and it seems that he was one of the only people who was consistently supportive of Marilyn throughout her life. In 1962, Marilyn returned to the spotlight and began filming the comedy Something's Got to Give, However, she was frequently absent from the set due to illness, and she was fired from the film in June of that same year. The studio completely regarded medical advice from Marilyn's doctors, calling her to set even though she was ill, and even attempted to pressure her into working more frequently by telling the media that she was faking her sickness. She was rehired, but her work on this film never resumed. On May 19th of 1962, she traveled to New York City to attend a gala where she famously sang happy birthday to President John F. Kennedy. For the occasion, she had worn a dress by designer John Louise that was covered in rhinestones and gave the illusion that she was naked. Marilyn first met JFK at a Palm Springs party in March of 1962, so earlier that same year. This performance happened at Madison Square Garden, and the clip of her singing has become very iconic. After the now-famous performance, President Kennedy came on stage and said, quote, I can now retire from politics after having had happy birthday sung to me in such a sweet, wholesome way, end quote. There is a famous photo from this night that showed Marilyn at a Hollywood executive's townhome standing with JFK and his brother Robert Kennedy, which started to fuel rumors that she was having an affair with JFK, Robert, or even both. 
Marilyn bought her first home in California's Brentwood neighborhood in 1962 for $75,000, and though she had just been on the cover of Life magazine, her life was far from picturesque. After several months as a virtual recluse in her Los Angeles home, Marilyn passed away from an overdose on sleeping pills or barbiturates on August 5th of 1962 at the young age of 36. Her death was ruled a probable suicide based on her history of drug use and previous suicide attempts. The official police statement was that her death was, quote, caused by a self-administered overdose of sedative drugs and that the mode of death is probable suicide, end quote. It was later determined that she had died between 8.30 p.m. and 10.30 p.m. on August 5th, with her body being discovered in the early morning hours of August 6th. She was found naked in her bed lying face down with an empty bottle that held 50 sleeping pills, a drug called Nembutal, that was found by her bed and she also had a phone receiver in her hand. This prescription had been given to her just a few days prior by Dr. Hyman Engelberg, who had told her to take only one per night, and also found on her bedstand were another 12 to 15 medicine bottles. Returning to Marilyn's mental health struggles, by the time of her passing, she had been seeking help from a psychiatrist named Dr. Ralph Greenson. Marilyn was deeply struggling with depression, and her behavior in the final months of her life has been described as increasingly erratic. Around 5.15 p.m. on Saturday before her death, she had spoken with him for about an hour on the phone, and according to the police, she was, quote, told to go for a ride when she complained that she could not sleep, end quote. At around 8 p.m. on Sunday night, Marilyn's housekeeper, Eunice Murray, saw Marilyn go into her bedroom. At 3.25 a.m., she reported noticing the light in the bedroom was still on, and she went to go check on her but got no response. She called the psychiatrist, and Greenson came over and broke the window to enter Marilyn's bedroom, only to find her dead. She was pronounced dead by her physician, Dr. Engelberg, who was called by Eunice and Greenson, and he made the declaration at around 3.50 a.m., At 4.25 a.m., the police were finally notified of Marilyn's death, well over an hour after she was discovered. Oddly, Eunice's story to the police changed several times. Once she said that she called Dr. Greenson at around midnight, later saying that she called around 3 a.m. And this was just the start of the strange discrepancies with Marilyn's death that many have cited as a reason that foul play was involved. Firstly, according to the coroner's report, Marilyn overdosed on over 40 nebutal pills, however, there wasn't a single pill found in her stomach. Deputy Coroner Dr. Thomas Noguchi later tried to explain this by contending that because she had a long history of substance abuse, the pills in her stomach were digested more quickly than someone who wasn't an addict. And this could make sense, however, it does seem extremely hard to accept that a fatal dosage of pills would dissolve so quickly. Dr. Thomas Noguchi was the one tasked with Marilyn's autopsy, however, according to him, when he received her body in the morgue, the samples from her stomach and intestines had been destroyed. Because of this, the only parts of her body that could be put to complete toxicology tests were samples of her blood and her liver. Though tests were still run, the destruction of the organs did affect the toxicology reports, and this has been cited as an extremely suspicious detail for those who believe that foul play was involved. Even just based on the extent of the toxicology testing, it becomes very difficult to take the coroner's determination of an overdose at face value. Another suspicious detail was the housekeeper Eunice Murray's behavior on the morning that Marilyn was found. Sergeant Jack Clements of the LAPD was the first to arrive on the scene, and when he arrived, he recalled that Murray was running the washing machine, possibly washing Marilyn's sheets. Detective Sergeant Robert Bryan also arrived shortly after Clemens, and he wrote, quote, It is officer's opinion that Miss Murray was vague and possibly evasive in answering questions pertaining to the activities of Miss Monroe during this time, end quote. Byron also noted that she was acting like an unreliable witness. Apparently, Marilyn relayed a strange message to Peter Lawford, an old friend of hers and brother-in-law of JFK, just hours before she died. The two spoke on the phone, and according to Lawford, apparently she seemed under the influence, and she told him, quote, Say goodbye to Pat, say goodbye to the president, and say goodbye to yourself because you're a nice guy, end quote. This message in particular has fueled theories that JFK was somehow involved in Marilyn's death. Marilyn's death was front-page news across multiple countries, and hundreds of her admirers crowded the streets outside of where she was laid to rest. Marilyn was buried in her favorite Emilio Pucci dress in a Cadillac casket 
which was the most high-end available. It was made of heavy-gauge bronze and lined with champagne-colored silk. She hadn't owned a home until the last year of her life and had surprisingly few possessions, one of her most prized being an autographed photo of Albert Einstein inscribed, quote, to Marilyn with respect and love and thanks, end quote. It wasn't until the 1970s that theories of foul play and conspiracies to kill Marilyn became mainstream. This was with the publication of Norman Mailer's biography titled Marilyn in 1973. This book speculated that Marilyn had been having an affair with Robert Kennedy and that she was killed by either the FBI or the CIA to protect the Kennedy's family image, and the theories really took off from there. Even today, the most famous theory is that Marilyn had been killed because she'd been having a relationship with one of the Kennedy brothers, either with JFK or Robert Kennedy. It is believed that she either had threatened to reveal the relationship or that she had information that was linking the two men to organized crime. Either that or she had been in their presence while one of the men was divulging government secrets. Apparently, she had been writing down some government secrets in a little red diary, but there is still a lot of confusion as to whether or not this book actually exists. Interestingly, Robert Kennedy was in fact in Los Angeles on August 4th, the day before Marilyn's death, and her housekeeper came forward two decades later to say that Robert visited Marilyn on the night that she died and argued with her. However, the reliability of any of Eunice Murray's statements is highly questionable. It has been suggested that Robert was integral in a plan to induce her suicide, giving her the barbiturates and essentially leaving her to die. Another theory involving the Kennedys is that the CIA killed Marilyn because they knew that she was having an affair with Robert and they used her death to get back at the Kennedys for the Bay of Pigs disaster. This one does seem kind of plausible considering it was clear that the Kennedys were very fond of Marilyn, so it is difficult to imagine them conspiring to kill her. Another theory has been most famously corroborated by Frank Sinatra, who believed that Marilyn had been killed by mob activity. In a memoir written by Sinatra's former manager, Tony Opetisano, he wrote, quote, Frank believed she was murdered and he never got over it, end quote. Frank and Marilyn were close friends, and she considered him a confidant. This was not a romantic relationship, as, quote, Frank felt she was too troubled, too fragile for him to sleep with and then walk away, end quote. Just before she died, Marilyn had spent a weekend at a lodge that was partially owned by Frank, reportedly to spend time with her ex-husband, Joe. Supposedly, Frank heard rumors that Marilyn had been killed by mob boss Sam Giancana's man. In the memoir, Opetisano wrote, quote, she'd been murdered with an imbuto suppository and Robert Kennedy or the mob was involved, end quote. This is interesting to consider. Frank Sinatra was much closer with Marilyn than most others in her life and he never believed that her death had been accidental. Another theory is that 20th Century Fox could have been involved with a possible cover-up based on the behavior of those who discovered Marilyn's body and reported her death. The police weren't notified until 4.25 a.m., almost an hour and a half after she was supposedly discovered in bed, during which time Eunice Murray, Dr. Greenson, the psychiatrist, and Dr. Engelberg, her physician, were alone at the scene. When they were asked why they hadn't called authorities earlier, the doctors claimed that they needed permission from 20th Century Fox's publicity department before alerting the authorities. Because of the changing timeline provided by Eunice Murray, people have speculated that Greenson and Murray were staging a cover-up of Marilyn's passing between midnight and when the police were actually called. And something that was fascinating to me, Marilyn's case was actually almost reopened in 1982 when District Attorney John Van de Kamp ordered a review of her death. This review was 29 pages long, and it took three and a half months to prepare. After investigation, it was determined that there was no foul play, noting, quote, based on the evidence available to us, it appears that her death could have been a suicide or a result of an accidental drug overdose. It is possible that while her ingestion of a lethal quantity of barbiturates was voluntary, she may have been in such a state of emotional confusion that she lacked a clearly formed purpose, end quote. The questions left behind in Marilyn's case have opened the door for a number of different conspiracy theories to develop, and I am always one to approach conspiracies with a lot of skepticism. However, I think there's definitely something to be wary of with her death. The handling of her autopsy and her post-mortem toxicology, paired with the fact that her housekeeper was so dodgy about the timeline, and how long it took for those around Marilyn to call the police is way too suspicious to overlook. 
I also found it compelling that Frank Sinatra, someone who knew Marilyn very well, never believed her death to have been an accident or a suicide. It is certainly interesting to examine the possibility of the Kennedys' involvement, the mob activity, and the CIA, and I'm not sure where I lean on who was responsible. However, I do believe that her studio was involved with a cover-up based on the fact that the publicity department required notification before the police. Something about that just doesn't sit right with me, and it seems like the most likely scenario. I cannot say anything conclusively, however, and I don't want the pull of following a conspiracy theory to take away from the tragedy of Marilyn's early death, no matter what the manner of it ultimately was. By the sudden end to her career, Marilyn's total of 23 movies had grossed over $200 million, and her fame had surpassed that of any other Hollywood presence at the time. Her earlier perception in the public had been that of a dumb and seductive blonde, However, over time, this gave way to the figure of a sensitive, insecure woman who had fallen victim to the pressures of fame. Her striking beauty and the tragedy of her story have kept Marilyn in the public eye to this day, and she has certainly reached the status of an American cultural icon. Thank you for listening to this week's episode of the Crime Bistro Podcast, and if you're interested in learning more about Marilyn's case, all of the sources are listed in the show notes at crimebistro.com. If you have a theory of your own to share, feel free to head over and visit the podcast on YouTube or on Instagram at Crime Bistro Podcast to leave a comment and to see some behind-the-scenes updates on the episodes to come. With that, this story is coming to a close, so thanks again, and as always, until next time.